This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good evening, my name is Frank Alexander and I'm delighted to welcome you all to Emory Law School this evening. Thank you very much for coming out and being with us. Tonight's program is on Where Do the Children Live? This is the fourth in a series of presentations that are part of our Family Forum series of the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion. The first in these series was in the early fall focusing on who cares for the children with presentations by Don Browning and Martha Feynman. We followed that with a presentation on what happens to children in peril by President Jimmy Carter in conversation with Professor Martin Marty. The third in the series was Children, Will We Ever Get It Right? with conversation by Dr. Bill Fagey and Professor Martin Marty. Tonight's presentation is on where will the children live? with conversation by Dr. Martin Marty and Mr. Millard Fuller. Tonight's presentation is also part of the Decalogue Lecture Series of the Law and Religion Program. The Decalogue Lecture Series was established a few years ago by Professor Marion Kuntz in honor of her late husband, Professor Paul G. Kuntz. Prior Decalogue Lectures have included John Noonan, Mark Jordan, and Robert Bella. For over a decade prior to his early death, Professor Kuntz was working on a magnum opus on the Ten Commandments. Shortly before his death, he had completed a rough draft of this work, focusing on the Ten Commandments not only in Judaism and in Christianity, but across cultures and across societies. We are delighted that after three years of editorial work with the manuscript and guidance by several individuals, particularly Thomas de Evelyn and Colonel McNair, that this book has now been published and just is being released this week. So I commend it to you, The Ten Commandments in History, Mosaic Paradigms for a Well-Ordered Society. It is outside in the Hunter Atrium and order forms are there. We're particularly dedicated to Ms. Marion Coons, Professor Marion Coons, for making this possible and for the superb introduction she has written to this volume. Tonight we have with us in conversation Professor Martin Marty and Mr. Millard Fuller. Brief biographical sketches of each are found in the materials you have before you, so I'll add just a few words. As a Robert W. Woodruff visiting professor of interdisciplinary religion here at Emory, and also the Fairfax Cone professor, a distinguished service professor emeritus at Chicago, Professor Martin Marty is a person without peers the author of over 70 books, the recipient of over 70 honorary degrees, 
Professor Marty is described aptly as the foremost commentator on religion in the United States today. I classify myself now as one of the many, perhaps 10,000 or more students of Dr. Marty's, having been able to sit, sit and participate in a seminar of his last fall, one of certainly the high points of my education in working with him. Millard Fuller comes from a very different place. Since I'm a native of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, I can share with you that Millard Fuller is born and raised in a little town called Lynette, Alabama. Now, those of you that are not from this part of the country may not be aware of where Lynette is. It's very important for you to understand that it is just across the border, as we refer to it, the Georgia border, down near West Point. As you're heading down 85 towards Montgomery, as you cross the state line, Lynette's right there on your right. Growing up in Tuscaloosa, we consider that what Millard Fuller did was sort of a mixed kind of education. He went to that school called Auburn University, but then he had the good sense to come to Tuscaloosa to the University of Alabama School of Law, where he received his law degree. Following his graduation from law school, Millard entered into the practice of law with one of his law school classmates in a small firm known as Fuller and Dees in Montgomery. Finding the practice of law not sufficiently challenging, uh, Millard and his law partner decided to create a business where they started doing direct mail publishing of books, direct mail sales of books. This business was quite successful, ultimately sold to Times Mirror, freeing up Millard and his law partner to do some other things with their lives. His former law partner, Morris Dees, went on to found the Southern Poverty Law Center. During that period of time, Morris and Linda decided to pay, pay a visit to Conania Farms in America's Georgia. Conania Farms was an, an intentional Christian community created by Clarence Jordan. At the time that they were able to spend with Clarence Jordan throughout really the mid to late 60s, Clarence was able to influence them in ways that perhaps no one else ever had or ever will. Millard began building his first house on behalf of the Conania Farms communities in 1969, the year that Clar Clarence Jordan died. Many of you hopefully are aware of Clarence Jordan, and if not, I encourage you to become aware of him. He's perhaps most widely known um, for his cotton patch version of the Gospels, the cotton patch Gospels. Those of you who are considering going to see the forthcoming movie Passion, I encourage you to see it, perhaps to read at the same time Clarence Jordan's cotton patch version of the Gospels. You will see a very different picture and one that's equally powerful, I suggest to you. Not necessarily contradictory, but one that paints the Gospels quite differently. After creating partnership housing in, through Conania Farms in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Millard and Linda decided to head to Kenya. And that's where I just missed crossing paths with Millard once again, not just in Alabama, but in 1973. I had read Clarence Jordan's uh, Cotton Patch Gospels. I was moved, I was uh, inflamed in many ways with the passion that Clarence Jordan could express to those. And I had left college early and was headed to Americas in 1973. To visit with Clarence, uh, to visit with at that point uh, Millard Fuller, Clarence had died and on the way to Americas, I found that Millard and Linda had left for Kenya. So I stopped here in Atlanta to visit with another friend, Jim Laney, who sat me down and shared with me that he indeed also had a plan for my life. I never made it to Americas, so I'm still here at Emory and I'm delighted to be able to still be here. I'm delighted also to be able now finally after decades for me to meet Millard Fuller. When Millard and Linda returned from Kenya in 1976, they founded what we now know as Habitat for Humanity International, Habitat for Humanity, and then later on Habitat International. As the brief information you have indicates, Habitat now has been responsible for providing housing to over three quarters of a million people. They have built over 125,000 homes. Within the next 18 months, they anticipate having built homes that will house over a million people throughout the world. 
Home ownership in America is at the highest rate it's ever been, and I suspect that is due in no small part to Habitat for Humanity. This work of Millard Fuller's and Habitat for Humanity, I'm sure Millard would admit, is not his work alone. It is certainly the work of God through Millard, but it's equally important in many ways, it is the work of Linda. Now, where is Linda? There, there you come in. Linda has been Millard Fuller's partner for 35 years. She is the one who has edited the book. She is the one who has refined the vision for Habitat for Humanity. And I'm particularly delighted, Linda, that you're willing to be with us tonight because I would like to, for all of you to join with me in thanking and congratulating Linda and celebrating today her birthday. Today. <laughs> The format for tonight is not a lecture. The format we follow in this forum series is by way of conversation. It is a conversation about how we are going to house our children and our families in America and throughout the world. How are we, the most affluent nation in the world, going to meet the simple needs of providing housing for our children? Over 50 years ago, the United States Congress declared the goal of providing safe, decent, and affordable housing for every American. In the years since then, we have put somebody on the moon. We have eliminated smallpox. We've eliminated polio. We've created nuclear power. We've created the silicon chip. But we also have, this year, somewhere between 900,000 and 1.4 million children who will be homeless in the United States this year. Say a million, a million homeless children, 50 years after Congress declared the goal. It's a daunting task, so I'm delighted that we have Dr. Martin Marty and Mr. Millard Fuller here to help us think through these issues and these questions. Please join me in welcoming Professor Marty and Mr. Fuller. In a preface to one of your books recently, I saw that you talked about habitat for humanity and you wanted them to be filled with habitats. I had not heard that phrase before, but we're talking tots tonight, children. Children, children, children. And in the four family forums, our public ventures in this project on the child, uh, we've talked about lacks, the lack of food, children in peril, the lack of justice, um, the lack of health, and tonight, the lack of a roof, a roof over their head. And uh, I sort of envy you when you go to bed at night and can think through soon a million people under a roof because of this. And in almost every publication, I've followed it for years. I've had a son who's worked for Habitat and volunteered. And children, children, children are always there, Habitats. Um, we want to focus on that. Somebody at my vi visit there today said, uh, it's interesting to work for a company, he was from the industrial world and corporate world, a company that doesn't have a product, it has ideas. But I think of you even more as having stories. So I think a good way for us to get launched here, I'm gonna trust you to come up with a good one, um, because uh, you took us on a little tour this morning. And there are a lot of pictures of you with dignitaries, presidents, ambassadors, but you mainly fixed on a little boy in Romania? That's right. Why? That is a great story. Uh, and um, in fact, I think it's one of the greatest stories uh, in the Habitat ministry. Um, Linda and I were privileged uh, to be in Romania on Saturday, June 21st of this past year. And we were there for a very special reason. Uh, we were in Romania to dedicate the 100th house built in that country. Habitat is now building in about 3,700 cities in 92 countries. Um, but it was not only the 100th house in Romania, it was the 150,000th house that we have built worldwide. And uh, we arrived at the site 
Um, and and it, was a, it was a very dramatic uh, sight because the old house that the family had been living in um, was visibly uh, a poor house. And when we went inside, we could see even how much worse it was than it appeared from the outside because the house had been leaking, obviously, for years and uh, was filled with black mold. And uh, we were told that this family, which uh, consisted of a father and mother and five children, uh, we were told that the children were perpetually sick uh, because of this mold. And Habitat for Humanity had built a new house literally about this far from the old house. And it was in contrast to the old black house falling apart with the windows broken and the, the tiles broken and, and leaking and full of mold. The new house was white and bright and light and beautiful and completely uh, appropriate for a family to live in. Well, the service of dedication was out in the yard and uh, we gathered there on a platform. It was a very large crowd. And I looked over at the family when it, when it came time for me to speak and there was the mother and father and the five little children and the little, the, 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 the baby of the family was this cute little boy who I had learned was named David, David Baco, four years old. I had just met David a few moments earlier, but, and he was, that was a Hungarian family living in Romania. And I don't speak any Hungarian and this little kid didn't speak any English, but I just beckoned to him and he came to me and I took him in my arms. It was one of those sort of magical moments and, and he just accepted me. And I held him in my arms. And for my whole 20 minutes of my speech, he helped me make it. When I would say something funny, he would laugh. <laughs> when I would say something serious, he would look serious. And, uh, and what I said that day was that I had just met this little boy. I had just met the family. And that I might never see them again in my life. But I knew something that we were giving that child a better chance. When he moved out of that old moldy house into his new house, he wouldn't get sick anymore because he was living in a healthy house. And I said, in a couple of years when he starts to school and his teacher gives him some lessons, he'll have a good place to go and study his lessons. And he'll, whatever he becomes in life, and I don't know what that will be, we are giving him a better chance, a chance to to be all that God created him to be in life. But I said, I do happen to know what happened to another child. The child that moved into, one of the children who moved into the very first house that we built that Frank mentioned down at Cornelia Farm. Interestingly enough, the first house we ever built was for a mother and father and five children. Exactly the same composition of that family in Romania. And in those early days when we were just getting started, it was very much a mom and pop operation. So I went to Auburn, as you heard, and I learned how to survey. So I surveyed off the streets. And, uh, and being raised up in Lynette, Alabama, and my dad was a small, small town businessman. He had some rental houses. I was always out there repairing rental houses, putting on roofing, putting in new doors and windows. And even in college, I, I worked one summer in construction. So I helped build that first house. Uh, when it was finished, I had, I'm an old furniture mover from Chicago. I used to work for Gold Blast Department Store and move furniture, so I helped to move the furniture in. You might have moved stuff into my house. And then I may have. If you ordered a sofa and lived on the third floor, I did. Um, but being a lawyer, I closed the sale for that first house. And when we came to the time of signing the mortgage, that father, who was a very, very intelligent man, but he had never had an education and he couldn't read and write. So he had to sign the mortgage with an X. And um, in that family, as I said, were five children. And one of, the, one of the children was a little girl whose nickname was Cookie. And Linda and I had the privilege of watching little Cookie grow up in that house over the years. And uh, today, that child whose father couldn't sign the mortgage is writing mortgages because she's a lawyer. And uh, she has her own law firm in Washington, D.C. And she writes mortgages and takes care of other legal matters. 
So I said, I know what happened to that first child. We gave her a chance, and she grabbed it and ran with it. And, and, and the other children in that family have all done well. But uh, to me, the, the symmetry of that story is so beautiful. Uh, going back to the first, fast-forwarding to the 150,000th, knowing what happened to one of the children in the first families, not knowing what will happen to this little boy uh, in Romania, but knowing that we gave him a chance. And I think that's what we ought to do for all children, give them a chance. I was so moved by that picture. I'm going to stick uh, back with David Bacco for a minute yet. I uh, love children, and I have grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and I can't ever remember any time that I've held one that they haven't wiggled within 20 <laughs> seconds in the middle of 20 minutes. So let's go back to this. You have a trustworthy-looking face and all that, but uh, somehow he was prepped for this. He must have seen his family in sweat equity, or how do, you, how do you suppose he got ready to know that that ceremony was opening his future? I don't know. It was an amazing thing. There happened to be uh, a law firm there who had been working all week from, from London. And they told me afterward, they said, we, we are dumbfounded that David let you hold him because we've been trying to hold him all week and he, will run, he won't let any of us hold him. So I thought maybe the, the, you know, the moral of that is American lawyers are better accepted by those people than <laughs> British lawyers. <laughs> you got to go a fur piece away to get, get the acceptance. But the family had been doing sweat equity, not the little four-year-old, no, but, but that's the whole uh, modus operandi of Habitat for Humanity is the families help build the houses, and even smaller children, to the extent they're able to participate, we strongly encourage that. Tell me about that a little bit, because um, you know, the child labor laws, so you can't have, uh, in the U.S., you can't have the child working. Can she pick up the hammer with, with daddy and, and uh, pitch in? In other words, are they involved in, in, in the uh, assertive agent form, or are they the passive characters? Uh, first of all, uh, we, we, we try to deal with the family as a unit and encourage the whole family to participate. Obviously, you don't give a four-year-old a power uh, saw. Uh, you don't even give a 10-year-old a power saw. But within the framework of what is uh, uh, safe, uh, we have the children to plant shrubbery, to do painting, uh, to do other tasks which are suitable for that, any particular age group. Uh, but we do have the sweat equity component, which is typically several hundred hours, so that the family, when they move in, they don't only uh, know that they are a homeowner because they got a piece of paper that says you're a homeowner, but we want them to feel a psychological and spiritual connection with that house. We also want them to gain practical skills of how to... Uh, repair a broken window if they have one, or to put on a shingle that's blown off in a, in a windstorm. So there are practical reasons why we do the sweat equity, but one of the underlying fundamental reasons is, as I said, to give them a connection with that house so they bond with their own house and know that it's their house, they help build it, and we want the children to participate as much as possible. I'm going to back you up with uh, childhood a little bit then. I have a friend, uh, Holly Frazen, a composer in Boston who wrote a an oratorio for children's choir on the story of Abraham and Isaac, the binding of Isaac, from the child's viewpoint. And it looks so different. Uh, Isaac thinks it's a game. Here I am, Daddy. I'm behind this tree. Here I am, Daddy. Here you dropped this knife. Here's the knife. And it's, you know, it's chilling because you see that. Um, and also some of the best stories, a positive story. That's it's a good story of a, of a bad scene. Uh, to get the child's angle. Picture yourself, because you know so many of these children, you're a child, and you're seeing your parents and their neighbors and their friends going about it, and you've been in a rat hole and nothing else. What, what's going on in your mind? Well, again, I might tell you a wonderful story. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a little boy uh, living out in Olympia, Washington. Uh, his name was Charlie, and uh, he was homeless. His father lost his job. And they lived in a car. And little Charlie, who was about 10 years old, he hated that. Uh, fortunately, they were able to get out of the car and moved into a very derelict apartment, which was still very inadequate. And they learned about Habitat for Humanity there in Olympia. And, uh, and they applied for a house. And little Charlie, just at age 10, was very, very aware of what was going on. Well, one night, the 
Family Selection Committee visited their home. Uh, Jerry and Cindy Schultz, who are good friends of Linda and me, they were on that committee, and they told us this story, and a dramatic story of, of going in, passing the pleasantries of the day, and then saying the magic words, your family has been chosen to get a new Habitat house. Little Charlie, who was all eyes and all ears, he started jumping up and down on the floor like a rubber ball saying, we won, we won, we won. <laughs> We're number one. <laughs> and uh, he participated in building the house and got complete with a tree house in the backyard. And the beautiful thing about that story is that the new house was in a different school district. And little Charlie, when they moved, went to a different school and they somehow didn't transfer his records and so they didn't know that he was a slow learner. Six months went by and the teachers of Olympia, Washington had a teacher's conference and somehow the two teachers got together, Charlie's old teacher and Charlie's new teacher, and the new teacher said, how is Charlie doing? He said, oh, he's a solid B student. What, is, what, is, what do you mean? He's a solid B student in the regular course. She said, that couldn't be possible. He's a slow learner. She said, he's not a slow learner in my class. <laughs> and the only thing that they could conclude was that the two things had changed in that little boy's life. He had a good place to live, and he had received a huge dose of encouragement and affirmation. And it had a profound impact on how he performed in school. I've read some of your uh, things in describing children are embarrassed to to live in the house they are. Mm -hmm. So the, the dignity theme is for, big for them? Absolutely. I hear that as much as anything. Uh, we know, uh, and I personally know of children who come home from school and will not get off the school bus where they live because they don't want their uh, fellow students to know that they live in this terrible house. So they'll drive, ride an extra block or two and get off and walk back. Uh, so that the, their, their little uh, buddies uh, don't know where they live. I, I remember going to a house there in America, Georgia, uh, this, this homeowner, she was a single mother with four children named Annie, and I went in uh, to see her soon after they moved in, and I just said to her, Annie, uh, what is it about this house that means the most to you? And just like that, she said, my boys are no longer ashamed for their friends to know where we live. When you hear stories like that, um, I said, I envy you that you, you can sleep at peace knowing all these people in houses you built. Now, what are your biggest frustrations? What are the biggest problems? What, what dreams go unfulfilled? When you came down today to visit with us, I, I, was, I was sorry that I, I couldn't spend more time with you because I was uh, filming uh, what every year I put out what is called an annual uh, message to the affiliates. I, I get in front of a camera and, 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 and send out a message. And uh, I, I'm filming my message that's going out to all of the affiliates in the 3,700 cities where we work in 92 countries. And I, and I filmed it at, at what we call Habitat for Humanity University, which is a new creation uh, that we have uh, created down there to train leadership uh, for the growing movement of Habitat Humanity and in a larger context to try to uh, train leadership to end poverty, housing, and homelessness in the world. And so the question is, is, is asked in that video, which will be released in a few weeks, what is Habitat Humanity's greatest need? And the answer is leadership, leadership. We have some great leaders uh, in Habitat. Uh, Larry Dale Martin is here tonight. She's the, the very talented director of Habitat Humanity here in, New York, in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, but uh, the need is so great, and the laborers are so few. We, we have many more people out chasing the next dollar and trying to figure out how to build a bigger mansion for themselves than we do have people out trying to figure out how to build another modest house for another Charlie and Cookie and David in the world who so urgently need it. So leadership is absolutely the greatest need that we have in this work, and it's my greatest frustration when I see so many talented people who are not using their God-given talents to help others <laughs> as much as they are to help themselves. Are the stories of children good recruiting agents? It just seems to me that I'm a little old for this, you know, but um, 
as I say, I have a son involved with it, and he always would come home with stories of, of the children involvement. Right. Um, do they also help recruit leaders? The kids say, Grandpa, Grandma, what are you doing? If people will allow themselves to be influenced by the children, you know, we build barriers to keep ourselves away from unpleasant uh, things that we maybe don't feel like we want to get involved in quite yet. Uh, we build neighborhoods and put walls around us so we can keep undesirable people out. Uh, and, and we make sure we don't go to certain places because we might see a suffering child and that might hurt our consciences. So, you know, just make sure you don't go experience that. But I think if, uh, if, 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 if a person will allow himself or herself to get into proximity with these children, their hearts will be so touched. As you know, uh, former President Carter and, and uh, Ms. Carter, Rosalind Carter, are our two best known volunteers uh, in Habitat Humanity. They just completed their 20th annual build with us in Anniston, Alabama, and LaGrange, and Valdosta, Georgia. But I've heard President Carter say on numerous occasions that he has learned more about the problems of the poor working with Habitat Humanity over the last 20 years than he ever did as governor or president because he has come face to face and he has gotten to know personally the mothers and the fathers and the children who live in those houses and it has touched his heart as it will touch the heart of anyone who will get close and come to understand what the real problems are. Well, I got a glimpse of how subversive you are today because we toured the global village, you might describe that a little bit, and uh, there are places where, where uh, you have a a replica of a little school from Africa and so on with little right. benches, what are they right. for? But right. well, we have a lot of kids come here and they can picnic here and so on. And I think that's was subversive to get them there. They must go <laughs> home and spread the word, right? Right. What you're talking about, of course, is our Global Village and Discovery Center, which we've built there in America, it's on six and a half acres. Uh, and you go across, as you saw that today, our recognition plaza and then into the visitor center and then you go through a slum. This is a typical generic slum that you might see uh, in Bombay, India, or Manila, the Philippines, and you see the kind of actual living conditions of, uh, of poor people around the world, and then you walk out of that into uh, Central America and into Africa and into Asia and see the kinds of houses uh, that we're building. But one of the, and we had the official dedication for this uh, new place uh, in June, but we are thrilled that we are having literally hundreds of school children go through there. And they are being impacted by it. I remember we had a little boy go through with his parents uh, recently, and he, he was looking in one of these miserable little hovels, and he said, Mama, do, 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 do babies live here? And she said, yes, babies live in those kinds of conditions. And die. And die. And that you could see that little child was so impacted by that. Mm -hmm. And he was thinking, Babies shouldn't live in these kinds of conditions. Children shouldn't have to live like this. Charlie jumped up and down when he heard we won. Um, what about the kid next door that didn't win? Uh, how does Habitat extend itself to those who can't make that minimum investment and so on? Is, is your example, in other words, you're not the only organization in the world, you're in, you're in teamwork with Good governments, poor governments are good, and uh, NGOs and so on. Um, you can't touch the poorest of the poor in a way. Well, Habitat Humanity has a niche. Uh, we, we build houses uh, with and for families who are too poor to go to the bank, uh, but we don't build houses for people who uh, don't have any resources. You know, there's some people right here in Atlanta, they are homeless people who if you gave them a house as a gift, they couldn't handle it. They mm -hmm. couldn't handle that responsibility. But what we advocate in Habitat Humanity is that every human being, I don't care who they are, should have a decent place in which to live. That means some of them will be homeowners, others of them should have a decent place to live uh, with some other arrangement. Habitat Humanity has never said we are the be all and do all and everybody else can go out of the housing business, we'll take care of everything. We work harmoniously with governments. We work harmoniously with other agencies, other homeless agencies, other agencies that are involved with housing. But that's why, for example, in our home county, 
of Sumter County, Georgia. Um, we, we created what we call the Sumter County Initiative back in 1992, and we set a goal to end all substandard inadequate housing by the year 2000, and we accomplished that. But Habitat for Humanity was in the equation. The Housing Authority was in the Sumter County Initiative. Some for-profit builders were in there. All the churches in our city and county were in there. And it was a collaborative effort. And by working together, I was able to stand in front of the Thomas House on September 15th of the year 2000 and lead about 400 people singing the old Southern Gospel song, Victory in Jesus because that house symbolized our victory over substandard housing. And that successful effort, and I might say quickly uh, as I'm going along, that doesn't mean we've quit building houses in Sumter County. You can't eliminate poverty housing and quit building any more than you can eat a big meal and quit eating. Uh, so we keep building, but a smaller number to keep from falling back into poverty housing. But that successful effort has given birth to what we call the 21st century challenge, where we challenge cities and we challenge Atlanta, we challenge Lairdale Martin and the Atlanta Habitat Organization to do a study, find out all of the children in Atlanta who don't have a decent place to live, and figure out a comprehensive plan of how you can bring all of the agencies together and by a certain date in poverty housing. Now, we've done that in Anniston, Alabama, LaGrange, Georgia, in Valdosta, Georgia, and in June of this year with President Carter and with 4,000 volunteers, in five days we built 92 houses in those three cities. And in all three of those cities, they've done a comprehensive plan and they have a definite date by when they plan to have eliminated poverty housing. So that's what we advocate everywhere, that you don't leave any child out. You don't say to some families, you're the lucky ones, you won, but the loser is over next door. We want every child to be a winner. We don't think any society is so well off that it can afford to squander a part of the next generation. We think every child should have, as a minimum, a good, simple, decent place in which to live. What percent of everything that's done in this nation um, has children under roof? I mean, some of your housing is for almost near retirees well, and so on? Most of the houses that we build, I'm sure that's true here in Atlanta, are for families. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't build 100% for families. We will build uh, for uh, couples without children or in some cases single people, but overwhelmingly Habitat for Humanity is building for families and that means children. That's why I say the children are in, in almost every picture I see. That's right. Um, what have you, it's a double question, what have you learned about children through humanity, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and what have you learned about Habitat for Humanity through children? Was the special eyes they bring, special voice, uh, the volunteers give you stories, the uh, staff gives you stories. Um, how do children show up different because you see this? Well, uh, it's amazing the insights uh, and the sophistication of uh, so many children. Children are constantly uh, surprising us. Um, like little Charlie, you know, he was totally aware of what was going on, totally engaged. Um, and, uh, and we know, for example, uh, when children, and especially the older children, when they get in their teen years and participate uh, in the building process, uh, they pick up skills. Uh, they, they gain tremendous self-confidence. I know of one child uh, that built a Habitat house. He was a failing student in school and in the process of building his house, he learned that he had this incredible aptitude for building. And so he began to pursue that as a career and his performance in school just totally blossomed because that was what turned him on. That was what excited him, was building something. So uh, we, 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 we see time and again that children uh, realize their aptitudes and. And, uh, and, and that is uh, learned and discovered and is helpful to the children. And it's, it's a two-way street. The children learn from the adults and the adults learn from the children. Labor Day weekend, Linda and you and Harriet and I had some meal together and I remember the most exciting thing in your mind is something that uh, raises questions for me that I think you can pick up interestingly. Um, 
children love ritual and they're gathering and they're singing these songs about Jesus and so on and they sing it best. But you were so excited about that you're moving into the Islamic world, mm -hmm. uh, Jordan and Lebanon. Right. That's right. Um, and you're an explicitly Christian organization and we're in a time of great tension with some Islamic forces. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work out? Do they are you accepted there? Is there suspicion? Are you doing good for the cause? Uh, in, in in some cases, uh, uh, originally there is suspicion. Um, Linda uh, was uh, in Egypt, uh, which is a heavily Muslim country. We've built uh, more than four thousand houses uh, in Egypt, almost all of them for Muslim families. We built some for Christian families, but uh, more for Muslim families. And we do have a presence in Jordan. Linda was there in Jordan uh, working, helping build. We've built more than 100 houses in Lebanon. We have an extensive presence in Turkestan, in Tajikistan, in Indonesia. We're in many uh, Muslim countries uh, and have built literally several thousand houses for Muslim families. We do operate as a Christian uh, organization, but we don't put any pressure on anybody. And from a strong theological reason, uh, we believe that God's love extends to everybody. Uh, God's love doesn't just extend to Baptists. <laughs> God's love extends to Methodists. God's love, uh, <laughs> God's love extends to Catholics. God's love extends to Muslims. God's love extends to, to Buddhists. Uh, so we don't look to the religious profession of people in term determining who gets a house and who doesn't get a house. If you're poor and you're in need, you qualify to be considered for a habitat house, whether you're here in Atlanta or whether you're in Jordan. So we go in, uh, the, the first uh, uh, place that we built in Jordan is very near the old uh, biblical city of Gadara, which is in the northwest part of Jordan, near that big cliff where the pigs jumped off <laughs> into the sea. Jesus sent them into the, into the sea uh, and, uh, and gained great disfavor with the hog syndicate. But, uh, <laughs> but when we moved in there to build, Every single family in that community of al Hema was Muslim except the grocer, who was a Christian. Um, and there was a certain amount of, you know, why are you people here? But now we just have wonderful, beautiful relations. You go into a community and start building houses for people and they catch on pretty quick, you must care for them. And that's the message we try to deliver. So I'm a chief in one of the stands, Kurdistan or Tajikistan, mm -hmm. uh, or let's say I'm an oil rich sheik. And, uh, there's a lot of poverty out there, a lot of poor children. I haven't been noticing it. And I'm giving you five minutes to make your case. What's your case? What, how, uh, what's cost-benefit analysis? Do we have a, uh, will we have a better country? Will we have? Uh, I, 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 I ask this question, and I, and, and, uh, and, and I do a lot of public speaking. And I don't care whether I am in this country, whether I'm in a Republican group, a Democrat group, a Christian group, a non-Christian group. You ask this simple question. Would your city... Would your area be better off if all families had a decent place to live? And everybody will say yes. I don't care who you are, whether it's the oil rich sheik or whether it's a corner grocer, whether you're a Christian or not. Um, any community would obviously be better off if all families who live there had as a minimum a simple, good, decent place to live. And that's what we advocate. So we say that's our agenda. That's why we want to come here. That's why we want to work with you. We are advocating for every family who lives here to have as a minimum a good, simple, decent place to live. Suppose we could produce 500 new leaders of the kind you're looking for, um, turn them loose. What's the resistance? Uh, not in my backyard? Or you, you, have, uh, you have some of that uh, resistance. Uh, there's the fear of the unknown. Uh, we've, had, we've had it here in the Atlanta area where people say, oh, Habitat is a great program, but please go build a house somewhere else because we know these poor people are going to throw trash in the streets. They're going to probably rob us, and, uh, and they're going to make our property values go down. So, uh, you know, we wouldn't want that. You know, we're good Christians, but uh, we certainly don't want our property values to go down. So do your good work in another neighborhood. Go over there where the Lutherans live. Don't work <laughs> over here with the good Methodists. Uh, and, and so we run into that. Fortunately, that is uh, not a typical situation. Uh, overwhelmingly, we are able to go into communities uh, and work harmoniously. But again, referring to Atlanta, I know there's one neighborhood here in Atlanta where there was some resistance because the people who owned the property there had these dreams of it becoming an upscale neighborhood. 
And so they, it was not in their perceived best interest to have affordable housing built there because they wanted the, the, the slums to be torn down and then really expensive uh, houses going in. They can sell their property for a big profit. <laughs> I'm not an oil rich sheik. I grew up in a house in Sioux City, Iowa that was moved down the street and uh, redone by Habitat for Humanity and it was upgraded. So mm -hmm. it, it improved the neighborhood and I think <laughs> <laughs> maybe my moving out helped too, but I, I, I was a little boy, I couldn't do that much damage. It was interesting to me that you described uh, Habitat for Humanity, Humanity as having a niche. Uh, Next year, 200,000 homes. 200,000. And a million people. Right. And that's a niche. Right. What else is out there? Uh, well, we are constantly uh, expanding the borders of what we do. Um, and we are expanding the borders in, uh, in numerous ways. Since we advocate for all families, all people, uh, whoever they are, to have as a minimum a good, simple, decent place to live, we realize that we can't afford to leave anybody out in terms of those who are helping. So uh, we have created, and, and Linda was very much a part of this, we've created a women bill department. Uh, 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 Dorothy Beasley is here tonight, who's a dear friend, and uh, she has been involved in this, where uh, women lawyers here in Atlanta and in other cities have helped build Habitat for Humanity houses. Uh, something over 500 of these houses have been built just in the United States. And, and we've expanded out to, because traditionally construction has been considered a man's activity, but not in Habitat for Humanity. It's an everybody's activity. Women are equally at the table with men in terms of building these houses. We've created a prison program where we don't leave prisoners out. And uh, unfortunately in Georgia, the laws are such that it's almost impossible to get prisoners uh, to be able to build Habitat houses. But in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and Texas, and a and growing number of other states, prisoners who are not eligible for release are making component parts of Habitat for Humanity houses, and those who are eligible for release are going out on the site and building them. Uh, we have a wonderful program now called Ability Houses, where we don't leave people out who are disabled. Uh, we built our first one in Birmingham. Every single person on the site was disabled. That whole house was built by people with disabilities. We call those ability houses. We do it in partnership with Ability Magazine, which is the official publication of people with disabilities. And so we don't want people with disabilities left out. And we've just started, a, we have an incredible program uh, called Campus Chapters and Youth Programs where uh, we create campus chapters uh, of students at colleges and universities. And at many colleges and universities today, Habitat Humanity, the Habitat Humanity Campus Chapter is the largest student organization on campus. And starting next week, 11,000 students have signed up this year to use their spring break to build habitat houses in 135 cities. And they've raised over a million dollars to take with them to buy building materials and they fan out across the country. And they're doing it in the Philippines, they're doing it going out from Japan, they're going out from Korea. And uh, the 11,000 figure is just US uh, students. So. That, and now we've gone down uh, uh, even lower age. We've started a program called Youth United, where children as young as five to 25 are organizing programs to raise money and participate in the building process as much as possible. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have created a program called First Shelter. Uh, the methodology of Habitat Humanity is, is helping people help themselves, sweat equity, making a monthly payment back every month for the house at no profit and no interest. But now we've created First Shelter, which we call in Habitat uh, terminology, the John the Baptist component of Habitat. The First Shelter program is not Habitat for Humanity, but it points to Habitat. Like John the Baptist was not Jesus, he pointed to Jesus. So we go into places like Afghanistan, and we have built about 500 houses in Afghanistan, but for people who are too poor to even make a tiny payment. So we just set up little stores and provide materials and help them build and in some cases repair their houses with no payback provision, but it's leading to creating a full-scale habitat program where eventually they will start making their payments back and it will become a full-scale habitat program. But we transition into it that way 
And Ed Brown is here tonight. His wife, Joyce, used to work uh, in Angola. And we're going to start a first shelter program in Angola where there's been so much devastation by warfare over the years. So in these ways, we're expanding our horizons. I'm um, going to go back to one of the groups you just talked about. I don't want to insult any undergrads that are here tonight because I love undergrads. But it wasn't very long ago they were children. What about Habitat in, for Humanity makes it so attractive uh, to, the, to people who are ex-children? In our seminars, uh, the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion, uh, I get to toss in questions. I'm a co-director of this. And um, it, naturally, we study abused children and victimized children and imprisoned and all that. But I also say one of the questions we should address is where do all the good kids come from? And I was uh, chair of the board of a college in Minnesota, St. Olaf, mm -hmm. uh, 27 of students, and there were 315 in uh, Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I was mentioning to some folks I was with today, when I was in college, not only did we not volunteer, we didn't even know what it meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, the seniors all say the kids are going to seed, and yet there, there aren't the good kids out there. What, what, what about Habitat for Humanity grabs collegians who may not be highly involved with politics or other things mm -hmm. as a means to change the world. What is it? I believe there are several components. Uh, as, as I think uh, everybody here tonight knows, a lot of young people are, are not flocking to traditional church services, but they are coming from traditional Christian homes in many cases. They've got the basic teaching of what Christianity is about but they don't like going to the traditional services. And I think Habitat for Humanity gives a conscientious, faith-concerned, faith-oriented child an opportunity to give expression to what he or she feels religiously uh, in a non-traditional way. And they go out to these sites. And I might say, while Habitat for Humanity is not a, quote, evangelistic organization, uh, we are having numbers of young people become converted and request baptism because of the experiences that they're having on Habitat construction sites. It's a very profound religious experience for a lot of people, not only young people, but for, for some older people as well. But it's also very, uh, it's very uh, quantifiable. You go out and, uh, and at the end of the day, you see what you have done. Mm -hmm. Not only see the house, but you meet the family and they come up and, and they hug you and they cry with you and you get to meet their children. And it's a, it's a very, very deep spiritual experience to go out and extend a helping hand, not to, to reach down to help someone, but to reach over as a partner. We are here to work with you, not for you. And that's, that's a powerful thing for the giver and the receiver. It almost sounds uh, sometimes, again, I'm going to get back to these college kids. Uh, I've watched children a lot, and sometimes they'll leap into the arms of a, uh, someone who's a few years older. Uh, but they inter interact wonderfully with 18 to 22-year-olds. Mm, that's right. Um, is that part of, the, part of the mix? Absolutely, absolutely. We'll send these 11,000 college students out uh, beginning next week and over the next six weeks during spring break. And they will make thousands and thousands of friendships mm -hmm. with the little kids. And they'll write letters to them when they get back to the college. And, and they'll share Christmas presents with them. And in some cases, they will go visit one another. Uh, as time we might be on to one of the main things that I've been after all, the, all, all evening. What do we learn about children from this? What do, what do children learn from this? They have models in these college kids who are on the way to making something, and right. the college kids get models out of kids whose lives are changed. That's right. Got any before and after stories of children? Uh, there are many. Uh, I told the one about uh, Cookie, of course. Cookie, yeah. Um, but my, our daughter Faith was down in Florida uh, just last week interviewing uh, a young man named Noel Garcia. Uh, Noel Garcia was raised up in uh, the second Habitat home that we built in Florida was for the Garcia family. When he graduated from high school, uh, he was valedictorian of his class, went on to college, had a very fine career in college, and is now a youth minister in a Hispanic church in Orlando, Florida. He says he has his dream job, mm -hmm. uh, but he was raised in a Habitat house. And, you know, he's, he's not a kid that's probably going to get his picture in the paper. He's not a, uh, you know, a spectacular success, but just a good, solid citizen who was given as a three-year-old, he moved into the house as a three-year-old, 
raised in a good environment by a good family in a good neighborhood. The whole neighborhood was all Habitat homeowners. And today he is a leader of young people, a leader of, of uh, youth in his church in Orlando, Florida. When President Carter was here in his series, it was noon hour, so there were more students around than there are late in the day. And there were a lot of law students, divinity students, and so on. <coughs> and he challenged the law students, first of all, don't only read books, go downtown and uh, get involved in some of these projects. Mm -hmm. He said that right after he'd handed me his own 19th book. <laughs> <laughs> so books. He might catch up with you one day. <laughs> he's, well, he's a very, very literate person. Uh, he's, uh, but there was a challenge, you know, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? Um, if you have law and divinity people in front of you, uh, you slid past a couple of things, and I'm, I'm a little nervous about this ending, and it's a little, some people say a little soft-edged, I didn't get into, um, governments. I've said collegians aren't as much involved with politics as they are with, uh, with hands-on things like this. Um, the government in this country and elsewhere, local government, state government, everyone you have to work with. And our national policies, are they helpful or, or irrelevant or? Uh, both, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes helpful, sometimes irrelevant, sometimes obstructionist. Mm -hmm. um, but Habitat Humanity, we are often asked, uh, is Habitat Humanity an advocacy organization? We do advocate. What we advocate for is every child to have a decent place to live. What we advocate for is every family to be able to afford as a minimum, a good, simple, decent place in which to live. Now, how do you get uh, the best government policies to make that happen? Well, one of the ways that we advocate is by putting public officials face to face uh, with these families. Uh, many of them uh, don't ever have that experience. Uh, that's the idea behind the Global Village down there mm -hmm. you visited today, is most people won't ever go walking around in a slum in, in, in Manila or in Bombay or Calcutta, India. So we bring the slum to them. So we're trying to do that to public officials. We have a program going on right now called Congress Building America. We were able to get a resolution through the United States Congress which calls for every United States representative and every senator to participate in building a Habitat Humanity House. And uh, they voted that resolution 100%. And we've got an office in Washington, D.C., and we bug the heck out of them <laughs> until they actually do it. And they go out, and they get to personally meet a low-income family. They get to go. And I'll tell you this interesting story. How this came up, the, 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 the forerunner project was uh, the houses that Congress built, where we got every member of the House of Representatives to build, and we got 377 out of 435 to build a Habitat House. And then we wanted to get a program called the houses that the Senate built and you and I have in common attending Renaissance weekend and in the year 2000 we uh, had Renaissance weekend at Hilton Head South Carolina and we were able to get the Renaissance uh, Institute to sponsor the building of a habitat house to be dedicated at sunrise on the first day of the year 2000 and there was a senator there attending Renaissance weekend named Kent Conrad the Democrat senator from uh, from North Dakota and uh, Linda and I were having brunch with him on, on New Year's morning, about 10 o'clock, and I asked him if he uh, had participated in this Habitat House. He said, no, I was busy with seminar and so forth, and I didn't get to participate. I said, well, the house is finished now, and the family's moving in this morning. Would you like to see it? So uh, they said, yes. I said, it's only 10 minutes away from this very swank hotel. So I drove him out there went into the new house. Here was the family moving in, joyous kind of situation. Everybody was happy the furniture was getting moved in. And they were walking around, the senator was walking around saying, oh, this is a nice house, oh, this is beautiful. I said, would you like to see where they moved from? I said, it's very near. He said, oh, could we do that? I turned to the homeowner, I said, could he see? Uh, and that was a single mother with three daughters, three older daughters, all four of them worked, and four uh, paychecks still couldn't afford to get a house through conventional means. Mm -hmm. So we built them a habitat house at no profit, no interest, they could afford it. But we walked over and the house was as bad as any poverty you would expect to see in a slum of Haiti. And they walked through the house and when they came out, the senator was ashen colored. I'm not kidding. And he was muttering under his breath, I had no idea, I had no mm -hmm. idea, 
I had no idea. And his wife, Lucy, was weeping. I knew I had him at a weak moment. <laughs> and so I said, Senator, do you think other senators should have this experience? He said, absolutely. I had no idea. I said, would you introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to have every senator build a Habitat Act? He said, I'll do it. And then I went and got me some Republicans, and, uh, <laughs> and I, made it, I made it bipartisan, and it passed the Senate unanimously, and that has now led to Congress Building America, where we're going to do it together and build Habitat Houses all over the country. And I think putting public officials face-to-face, -face, like Senator Kent Conrad was put face-to-face, -face, is an experience that helps them creatively think about what policies we should have to ensure that all families do have, as a minimum, a simple, decent place to live. Is the enemy apathy and indifference, or is it, do, do you have enemies? Uh, do you have people say, why do they bug us, or what, what are they about, or uh, we got a nice country, why are we paying attention to the You know, the core teaching of the, of, of our, in our Judeo-Christian tradition is to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The problem is that people don't love their neighbor as much as they love themselves. That's the problem. If we, could, if we could get that put into actual practice, then you can change the world. That's the way to change the world. That simple thing. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. We have a big Habitat affiliate in Sarasota, Florida, and I was down there recently to dedicate their 100th house. A hundred churches went together and, and, and sponsored the 100th house. When I was there, I learned that the Sarasota affiliate has a full-time crew that does nothing but salvage uh, light fixtures, commodes, sinks, lavatories, cabinets out of big houses that are being torn down to build bigger houses. And when I was there, they were salvaging materials out of a million-dollar house that had never been lived in, that was being bulldozed to build a $10 million house. I can tell, I know you enough to know that you're not a great fan of big, big, big houses, including even big houses for habitat building, right? We think modest is better. Uh, I, I, I spoke to a bunch of preachers at uh, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary one time, and it was about 200 preachers, and I said, uh, since you are a bunch of theologians, I have two theological questions for you. I said, first of all, is it possible to build a house so big that it is sinful? 200 hands went up. I said, now a more difficult theological question. Exactly at what point does a house become <laughs> sinful because it's too big? Dead silence. And then a little voice from way in the back said, when it's bigger than my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I've, I've worked you hard already, but we're going to work you a more yet. Um, Dean Alexander is going to come up, and uh, I'm confident there are people here who have questions stored up, and uh, you have Atlanta representative friends here. And... Oh, Wherever you go, you have friends, and maybe somebody's living in a habitat house. Well, as we open this up uh, <coughs> to questions from all of the folks who are here tonight, I want to first push you a little harder uh, in the direction that um, Marty started. It, it, my understanding is that historically habitat has been reluctant to accept public or government funds, that the funds come primarily from donations in the private sector. Mm -hmm. But there have been a few occasions to this. As you look at expanding the work of Habitat to reach more and more, particularly to reach folks with less income than mm -hmm. 15 to 18,000 here in Atlanta, are you going to reconsider Habitat policies of uh, uh, being reluctant to receive public funding? Uh, we, we, and that's the correct terminology, we are reluctant to uh, get too uh, entangled with government. We want government support. Uh, HUD, uh, Housing, uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, administers a fund which is appropriated by Congress. And Habitat has received almost $100 million in, in funding from the government to buy property. Uh, we aggressively seek government funding for what we call setting the stage. Uh, and setting a stage can take many forms. But we want the, we want the grassroots involvement in Habitat Humanity. And uh, you get that grassroots involvement through a private program. And we think it's a good partnership uh, of government limited to setting the stage and then using private funds, churches, individuals, businesses, uh, and so forth. But uh, we, we want that, uh, we want that uh, 
limitation for two primary reasons. Number one, we do not want to lose the grassroots character of Habitat for Humanity. These students, I was at Notre Dame recently. Habitat for Humanity is the largest student organization at Notre Dame. 1,200 kids are members of Habitat for Humanity campus chapters at Notre Dame. And they're just finishing their 10th house right now. They're going to finish it up in a few weeks. They wouldn't sign up. If you, went, if you went into Notre Dame and said, there's a government housing program that needs some, some volunteers, they'd say, go hire a contractor. They'd go hire a contractor. So we don't want to lose the grassroots character of Habitat. And secondly, we don't want to lose our ability to function as a Christian ministry. We sing Amazing Grace and pass out Bibles at house dedication services. And if you just throw open the doors and start taking every dollar you can get from the government, the ACLU is going to show up on your doorsteps and say, quit passing out Bibles, quit singing Amazing Grace. You know, you can't have any of this Christianity or any other uh, uh, elements of religion out here. And that is the heart and soul of what we do, is, is, is our religious Christian motivation, and we don't want to lose that. Thank you, Millard. All right, let's open it up. Questions from y'all. Yes, sir. Let me, Miller, before you do that, re repeat the question. Okay. The question um, it, directed to you, Miller, is mm -hmm. would you share with us um, some of your own religious journey, your own pilgrimage, mm -hmm. your own sojourn, um, and the practices that sustain you, uh, guide you in, in your own work? In case he's too modest, let me also throw in, um, I think your newest book is out there, which has... Uh, a lot of clues to the answer, but I want to hear, I want to hear the answer live, but uh, he does give a good record of it. So, uh, Marty mentioned a while ago in one of his comments about a certain subversive uh, uh, nature uh, to my character. Uh, but when I was raised in Lynette, Alabama, uh, I was a member of what was then a Congregational Christian Church. Today it's a part of the United Church of Christ. And I had a subversive pastor uh, who saw in me uh, a young person with leadership ability, and he directed me to a number of youth conferences at places like uh, Doan College in Crete, Nebraska, Elmhurst College in Elmhurst, Illinois, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, Doan uh, uh, Salisbury College in uh, Catawba, North Carolina. And I got exposed to some ideas uh, to some ways of thinking about the Christian faith that I wouldn't have gotten going to youth conferences in Alabama. I'll be honest with you. And, and I attribute my more liberal orientation and my more liberal understanding of the gospel of having a social implication to my experiences as a young person in the Congregational Christian Church. That had a profound impact on me. And, uh, and I've, I've continued to appreciate that to this day. Ed Brown, here's a fellow member of the United Church of Christ, and, uh, and I have a great appreciation for that uh, denomination. I, I, I now am a Baptist. I love Baptists. I married one. Uh, but I tell people I'm barely Baptist. I'm hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting your toe wet. <laughs> getting my toe wet. Well, uh, maybe if I can pursue a little more with this. Do you have a daily discipline? Do you? Uh... Uh, I, I have a certain daily discipline, um, and, and, and my discipline in a lot of ways is, is, is quite simple. I, I don't eat a meal without saying a prayer, whether I'm in a public place or, or at home. I try never to eat a meal without saying a prayer, and, uh, and that, that's a simple thing, but, uh, but I think it's a, a certain discipline. Uh, and then another part of the discipline is that Linda and I try to go uh, off to quiet places uh, two or three times a year where I'll have two weeks of uninterrupted. I don't have a cell phone. I don't want a cell phone. <laughs> uh, I see you have one. But I like... Uh, I, I like... I like, uh, I, I, like I turned it off for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to have times when I'm not interrupted uh, so that I can think. Uh, I wonder uh, if we would have had... Uh, 
you know, a lot of the writings that we have in the scriptures, if the people in those days had cell phones. <laughs> if they had tape recorders, we wouldn't have any saints either. <laughs> <laughs> They'd know their stories. <clears throat> yes, over here. And, and where are you located? The question is, what advice can you give us on developing homes, building homes for medically fragile children? I, I'll give you this word of advice. Um, uh, Linda and I were privileged uh, uh, to go uh, last year and again this year to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, we were designated by the Schwab Foundation. Klaus Schwab, who founded the World Economic Forum, created a foundation and, and designates certain people as what they call social entrepreneurs. And, uh, and they give, us, give social entrepreneurs all expenses paid to go over there and hobnob with uh, all these big business folks uh, in hopes that some of them will dribble some crumbs over the edge of the table uh, for our work. But uh, I met with some of these social entrepreneurs, and, uh, and they see Habitat Humanity as a, as a very successful program, and it's spread all over the, the world now. And, and, and they asked me the question, you know, what is your secret? What, what word do you have for us, these younger social entrepreneurs? And you are a young social entrepreneur. And I would say to you, as I said to them, you've got to figure out who, what is going to be your support base. Habitat for Humanity ran up the Christian flag from day one, and we've said we are a Christian ministry. And so we look to the Christian church in this country, 350,000 churches, and we look to the Christian church to be our primary partners. We have other partners, many, many other partners, but our primary partner is the Christian church. And a lot of social entrepreneurs like yourself see the need very clearly but you don't see equally as clearly where you're going to get any, the money, the resources to do something about it. So you've got to see clearly not only the need, but your resource base. Who's going to support you? Who are the logical people to support you in what you want to do? And you better learn how to talk their language, or they won't give you any money. <laughs> yes, right here. The, the question again, is, I'm interrupting Miller simply right. for purposes of the simultaneous webcast of this. They couldn't pick up the question. The question really looks at the evolution of the family as you've now looked at Habitat Homes for 30, 35 years that have evolved from perhaps a two-parent um, <coughs> structure with dependent children to a single-parent structure. And how has that influenced what you're <coughs> doing and what kind of support mechanisms are also being put in place? Well, first of all, I... I I have, not, uh, I have not seen any studies or any evidence that shows that uh, two parent families move into a habitat house and then somehow the man mysteriously disappears. What we are seeing is in this country especially, uh, we are building so many houses for single uh, parent families, mostly single mothers, some single men, but overwhelmingly it's single mothers. That seems to be a phenomenon pretty uh, unique to the United States. You don't see that nearly as much uh, in other countries. Uh, it's a tragedy because children need two parents uh, to help raise them. And especially if you've got a single mother who's struggling, sometimes working two and three jobs to make ends meet, the children are unsupervised. And uh, children are children, uh, and they'll get into trouble if they aren't supervised. So. It's a serious problem, but I would say a single parent mother is a whole lot better off in a decent house with her children than she is in a miserable dump somewhere. 
So you just do what you can uh, in a less than desirable situation and provide a good house. And also we try increasingly to build clusters of housing. Uh, uh, Atlanta Habitat is built over 500 houses and a lot of those houses have been built in clusters so the families can be mutually supportive and that's particularly important when you have a lot of single uh, parents uh, living there. That mutual support from neighbors is very, very important and helpful. Other questions? All the way at the back, yes sir. Yes, we will have a few minutes after the formal por portion of this session. Millard will be in the atrium for book signing and for visiting with him um, at, at 8 o'clock at the end of the session. Yes, ma'am. You just address me as Millard. I'll be looking <laughs> to somebody else. <laughs> Let me try to pull that together as the question.
for, the, for, all right, for those who are not in the room tonight but who need to hear the question, let me try to s pull it in a short form for you, Millard, very short, without doing able to do justice to your question, which is how do we, how do you, how do we together begin to communicate the conception of love for ourselves as a way then of dealing with our own insecurities, as a way of building our own sense of pride, as a way of then being able to reach out to others. I think I might, and, and I won't be able to do justice. Uh, you, you brought up so many uh, uh, interesting uh, ideas and thoughts. Uh, but let me tell you a story to respond to your specific uh, question, uh, which is a synthesis of what, what she has been asking. Uh, I was at Cornelia Farm a number of years ago, and a very handsome young man came in my office, and he started pouring out his woes to me. He had just uh, come off of his second divorce, and he was very distraught. And he told me at the end of his litany of all of his troubles and worries and problems, he said, I think I'm just going to go get a gun and shoot myself. And I told him, the guy's name was Jim. I said, Jim, before you shoot yourself, I wonder if you would let me take you on a little visit. And he, said, he was surprised at that response from me. And he said, oh, sure. So I took him out to a shack uh, where a blind woman lived and someone had been stealing her Social Security checks. And she was literally hungry. And the house was falling down. And she had nothing to eat. The house was bare. And, and I could see he was shocked to see that pitiful situation. And when we walked out of the house, I said, Jim, this woman has real problems. I want you to help her solve her real problems and you'll be able to deal with your imaginary ones. <laughs> and you know, he got very involved in that woman's life and I never ever heard another word from him about suicide. I think you can learn how to love yourself I think it's tied up with loving yourself, and, it, and it's obviously important that you love yourself. If you, if you don't love yourself and you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, you're not going to do your neighbor a favor. <laughs> um, so you've got to love yourself, but how do you love yourself? And I think reaching out and, 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 and loving neighbors increases love of self. That has been my experience, that to the extent that we're able to reach out to others and love them in real, tangible, specific, concrete ways, our love for ourselves grows almost in an exponential way. Thank you, Millard. One more, one more question. Yes, sir? This might be for our audience, it's not for Millard, but to correct you, Millard. One years ago, this, almost right now, I, I very wrote to this little two-house place called Habitat in America for Testament of Specialist. Vision. 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 You've got to have the vision before you ever get to action. For a secretary of Mars, once you get you know, volunteers and homeowners who are focused just on work, it has occurred to me that maybe it's the children, it's the puppies that to whom we need to turn to catch the vision for them. And I'm not giving up resources to involve the children in seeing the greater vision. The question is, um, does not the concept of vision constitute the starting point for action? At least in so far as habitat has been a part, what the question suggests is that vision was at the, at the start and that perhaps the key for habitat is children give the opportunity for vision right. as well as being part of vision. Is that the question? Absolutely. Ted Swisher is still at Habitat. Yes. He heads all of our work in the United States. Uh, I saw him today. He's doing a great job for us. But I think, uh, I think that's correct, uh, and I would be interested in Marty's response to this also. But I think what we must do as a society, and when I mean society, I'm talking about Atlanta, I'm talking about Georgia, I'm talking about the United States, and ultimately the whole world, we must cherish the children. It starts out with cherishing the children. We must fall in love with all of our children. 
with all of our children. And if we really cherish and love the little children, we will listen to them. Jesus told us very specifically to pay attention to the little children because of such is the kingdom of heaven. And if we will cherish the children and we will appreciate them, then maybe we will start listening to the little children. And the little children will lead us to a better place. I really believe that. I love children. I love that little David Baco in Romania, and he could sense that I loved him, even though I just met him. And I think the more that we learn to cherish and appreciate the little children, we will not be willing to consign them to some other part of town in some inferior, substandard, miserable place to live. We'll want all of them to have, as a minimum, a good, decent place to live. What would you say, Marty? I'm more interested in what you're saying than what I'm going to say, but I'll say <laughs> something because he asked me. <laughs> um, it was about vision and children catching it. And I think a big part of the secret of Habitat for Humanity is children don't learn through moralism. Button up your coat, go to bed on time. Um, and they don't learn from philosophy or theology. They learn from story, which your parents are living and you're living. Robert Wuthnow uh, made a study some years ago over half the American adults volunteer for something or other. 60% uh, of them through religious institutions, 70% on a religious motivation. He asked, what was it about religion that did it? And it was story. Both an old story, Good Samaritan story, Prodigal Son story, Gadarene Swine story. Um, we can skip that one. Um, <laughs> and and um, an exemplification of a story. And he, he said, I can't tell you how many of these collegians will say, I know somebody from our fraternity who was pounding up drywall in Philadelphia and next to him was a former president of the United States. Uh, you know, the way these stories go. And little children catch this more, and that's where I'll close with. Um, back in the 50s, I was on the editorial board of World Book, back when people got their reference books instead of the screen. It was the best-selling hardbound book in America, five and a half volumes every, five and a half million volumes every year. And one year, the editor, Roy Fisher, a Methodist uh, Sunday school teacher, uh, editor of World Book, said, you know, um, Rachel Carson has written a book about the environment, and we're not doing anything about that. If we want to change America, let's do it through the children. And he said, he's worried about the, what, the sky being polluted and the water being polluted. And Bucky Fuller, I mean, everybody like that on that board, we laughed. Oh, oh, what a, oh, oh we'll, we'll, we'll nurse him along. So it came out with a lot of glassine pages of what happens along there. We're kind of amused. It went at every school and all these homes. And you track it down, I think the environmental movement probably had more through kids catching imagination of what's happening to water than any adults. Um, so I think uh, that's why I said he's, he's kind of creatively subversive. If kids catch it, think of how many adult Americans quit smoking because the kids bugged them because somebody could talk health to them in a different way. Got a lot of dumb kids that started too, but basically, if they catch the vision, uh, I think that's a big part. That's why it's propaganda as for. Back to yeah, you. Yeah, I want to say one other thing. I know our time is about up, but uh, in, in this newest book that I've written, uh, uh, Building Materials for Life, Volume 2, there's a chapter in there on a bold new idea. And this is in line with what you're talking about, of, of, of the children can lead us to a better place. I, you know, in most societies, there's no transition from adolescence to adulthood. In Jewish culture, they have bar mitzvah, they have bat mitzvah. Uh, in traditional Messiah culture in East Africa, uh, a young man has to kill a lion. There's some adult circumcision in certain tribes in Africa. Here in the South, among wealthier families, you have debutante balls to present a young woman to, as a, at, at an age of about 16. Uh, to, you know, she's no longer a girl, now she's a woman. But in most cultures, you know, just drift from adulthood, from adolescence into adulthood. So I'm proposing that between ages 12 and 18, uh, and I wrote about this in, in this uh, chapter in this book, that every child in the world should participate in building a house for someone else who's not a member of their family. And if you could begin to get that adopted, that that's a way to transition from childhood to adulthood is participate in building a house for someone else. You can end poverty housing. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry that we must draw it to a close, but we must tonight. Um, our time has run short. I want to express my deep appreciation to Millard Fuller and to Martin and Marty.
The, the phrase that you have just concluded with, both of you, I think is a phrase that most powerfully exemplifies the life and work of both of you in doing it, which is the possibility that through children and with children, we can indeed catch a vision. You have given us a vision. Indeed, perhaps God has given the vision. We begin to see through you and through your work opportunities for doing that. Perhaps the message that all of us could take is simply to catch the vision and to be able to do it and with others. I also want to express my deep appreciation to uh, Professor Marion Kuntz for helping make the Decalogue lecture possible, to Amy Wheeler for all of her work in April Vogel, Dennis Wiggins and others, Corky Gallo, in making this evening possible administratively. I thank you very much. Please join me in expressing our deep appreciation to Millard Fuller and Martin Martin. In your programs, there is a gold card. If you could fill out that gold card and just share with us how you found out about the program and turn it in at the back. And um, volume two of Building Materials for Life is available right outside the door. Um, and Millard and Linda will be joining you out there shortly. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.